going? Hey, everybody. This is another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Um, we are when we are with one of our favorite guests, Katie Warnick, the CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. Um, and we've been talking about how it's really an interesting journey of change when it comes to labor and then the labor that we use and we need so desperately in the nonprofit sector. We're going to talk about headhunting, and we've never really talked about this, Katie, in all the times you and I have, have chatted. And so it's going to be a really, I think, vital conversation for so many. Another thing that's really vital and super exciting is that we have re-invited, um, or not re-invited, but we've restructured a little bit, and we're bringing in a bunch of co-hosts. They are incredibly diverse in thought, action, and deed. They work all over the country. And so we've been rolling them out uh, this month and next month. You'll see even more. And it's just amazing what they talk about and what they bring to the table. Super exciting. So um, I'm really excited for you to meet them. I'm also excited for you to know about our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Okay, Katie Warnick, CEO, Staffing Boutique, staffingboutique.org. Before we delve into this, can you give me the high-rise Manhattan skyline elevator speech about what Staffing Boutique does? Sure, sure. We are a full service staffing firm. So we do temp, temp to firm and permanent recruitment specifically for the nonprofit sector and education space. So that ranges from your admin assistant to your development assistant, to your grant writer, all the way up to your executive director, to your teacher in a charter school. Um, so we're constantly recruiting, screening candidates at a high volume level to fill your staffing needs quickly and efficiently. Amazing. And um you have been in this sector for, for a while. You just started your own firm kind of before the pandemic, right? I mean, you, you were pretty- No, no, no. I've been no. doing recruiting for, for 20 years now and I started um, my company in 2011. So I was <laughs> fairly young when I started my company. Um, it's been, I can't even believe it's almost been 15 years. It's crazy. Awesome. It really awesome. flies by. It does. <laughs> well, time flies when you're having fun and when you're good yeah. at having fun. That's yeah. what I'm um, I would also add that because you're a Sun Devil and wonderfully educated at Arizona State University, this afforded you this opportunity. I just had to plug it in. Sure. We can say that. <laughs> okay. Let's get on to um, one of the things that you and I have talked about. Um, and I think you always try to be um, diplomatic. But before we get into like the specifics of headhunting, you shared with us what you are observing, and I think a lot of folks are observing, about the general condition of the labor market. And you said something that was just riveting to me, and I'm going to ask you to kind of delve in a little bit about why the labor market is shifting and the um, ability for people to make commitments and work at a certain level has shifted or is shifting. What do you see? Yeah. yeah, well, we were talking about change, right? The workforce has changed. So is it ever going back to what we call normal? I don't think so. I think that for a while pre-COVID, we did feel um, the younger generation of workers was just at a different place than so many people that at the time, you know, were maybe above 32 in their career, if I'm using a number 30, 32. Um, but now post-COVID, we're at a place where I think that, let's just say, flakiness is uh, cross-generational. So it really doesn't matter what generation you're a part of. We are prioritizing different things here in America across industries, right? And you see it all the time. You hear people complain about it. Um, you see it with job searches, with candidates who are finalists are getting job offers and then bailing just because maybe the job was a hybrid job and they wanted to stay home 100%, you know? And not only are they bailing on the job, they're leading you on, <laughs> accepting, and then bailing. You know, they're they're kind of trying to see what they're worth. So we're seeing that with the interview process, and then we're seeing it with just the lack of commitment and consistency of actually going to a job every day. 
Okay, I, I have so many questions and I my sure. mind my mind is blown. Um this I am assuming is not just what you and your team are seeing. I mean, are you hearing about this from for-profit, nonprofit, you know, rural, urban areas? I mean, is it could could you say this is just in one area or is this really kind of blooming across the country? I would say it's across the country. I would say that my friends that own staffing firms that don't do the nonprofit sector see it as well. I hear it on podcasts. You know, it's it's kind of just the norm at this point. Um, you know, candidates don't want to work. We just kind of laugh and shrug our shoulders. But it's the truth. You know, if, if a resume comes in on a Saturday and you email that person to set up a, a call on Monday regarding a job that they applied to, you don't hear from them for a week. You know, it's that's bizarre to me because I'm coming from a culture of if someone sends you an email, even if you can't commit to a, a date or a response, you say, got your email, I'll get back to you on Monday. You know, one of those sort of situations. And then you just assume the person isn't interested in the job, right? But then all of a sudden you hear from them. Happens all the time. You know, it's like, you know, I, I look at my recruiter's responses from resumes, from job postings that they post. And I'll be like, did you reach out to this person? And they're like, yeah, I left them a message yesterday. And I'm like, they, they were slam dunk for this job. They applied, you know, they just don't respond. It's, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm pretty surprised and somewhat flummoxed by your comment that it's not just one generation. And I, I, I'm fascinated by that because I think sometimes it's very easy for uh, different generations to blame other generations, mm -hmm. you know? And so to hear you say that this is cross-generational, um, that's pretty substantial. I mean, that's a pretty substantial thing to say because it seems to me to speak to a complete shift in how yeah. we're working and how we're perceiving work. Yeah, we had placed a substitute teacher in one of our schools. The person was probably 15 years in with experience. Um, school loved them, wanted to take them full time. We're talking about salary negotiations and the person just didn't show one day. So if you're a teacher in New York City, and you just don't show one day. You know, we as a firm, we're nervous. You know what happened? So now it's day two, doesn't show. We're doing a wellness check, right? Yeah. Day five, the person emails their parent was sick. They flew home to where they were from. Which is fine. I get it. But there is no reason to just no call, no show, not respond to text, not respond to emails like the work, the work, the employment is just not priority. Very interesting. And also, before we move any further, um, you know, I think rather than just saying, you know, nobody wants to work and they're they're just screwing up. I thought it was riveting that you identified uh, prioritizing home health, mm -hmm. physical health, mental health, some other things that are replacing maybe. And and, and you think that's fair to say? It's like a replacement? I think that that's huge. And I don't think that it's wrong, but I think that we have all started to shift our mindset on what our priority are, priorities are on how we structure our week or our day. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, if we're talking about mental health, mm -hmm. on the front line, we're talking about exercise, nutrition, um, sleep, yeah. all of those things. And work is taking a back seat, unfortunately. And then we're, you know, coming from my perspective, where I'm involved in all these HR groups and what to do in this situation. And we're talking about empathy and sort of moving with our employees needs. Yeah, it's almost like the perfect storm for people to be a little bit flaky and then the employer tolerate it. Fascinating. And, and I would <laughs> say in the nonprofit sector, it's even more tolerated because we tend to have a, a, a higher level of empathy and even forgiveness, if you will. Oh, Versus sure. like yeah. the for-profit world where you're like, you're out. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. That's exactly what's happening. And, you know, and then at the same time, we have to talk about, you know, retaining staff, right? So as an organization, we almost have to tolerate it because we don't want people to quit. But then at the same time, we really aren't setting a high standard of what we expect from our employees. So it's really like, it's a juggling act at this point. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, you know, I, I do think you are on the, the cutting edge and the leading edge of this. I feel like 
you know, you, Katie Warnick, see a lot of these things, of course, because of your engagement with all these nonprofits and the educational systems, seeing things before um, they happen in other parts of the country has been riveting to me. I mean, I've, I've really, um, when I first met you, I was like, well, that's the East Coast. That's not going to really show up you know, in other parts of our country. Yeah. And it does, it it has, and it does. And so let's get into this other topic today and, and talk about headhunting. It seems like we used to use this word a lot back in the day. And now I'm kind of seeing a resurgence. What does this look like to you? And is this even a term we're using? Let's maybe it's start. A funny, it's such a funny term, right? Yeah. Um, I, I know I've spoken about my mother on this show before, but she spent her career in uh, corporate HR in the pharma industry um, before she retired at a foundation that I placed her at in, in HR. But she always used the word use the word headhunter when I was a kid, and I was like, "What is she talking about?" You know, uh, she was going out with headhunters. She was recruited by headhunters, and it turns out, you know, I kind of entered this workforce. So a headhunter is essentially someone who is an executive search consultant. That's kind of the name that we use now, just someone who's doing executive search. So typically at a higher level candidate, you know, top tiers, we're talking about CEOs, CFOs, executive directors, things of that nature. So essentially you're hiring a headhunter for your organization to essentially go and poach someone with a similar background coming from a similar industry to come work at your organization. So you, this is fascinating to me because you used the word poach. It Does that indicate that if you are out of the labor force that you kind of go to a lower, lower level or are you considered more attractive if you are already engaged with a, another firm, a company? Top talent is working. At the end of the day, top talent is working. And I think that anyone that works in the staffing industry is going to say that top talent is working. Ooh. They're always going to be employed. Okay. Uh, that that right there, uh, that's kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, okay, I get it. And I I think it's, yeah, I, wow, okay. That just makes me stumble a little bit because uh, so many people are changing and so many things have been changing. But I, I see what you're saying and having that attitude is that mm -hmm. you know, they're so good. Everybody wants them and and yeah, they're ready to go. And, and, and believe me, like we've all been laid off. We've all been fired. I've been in that situation. I've collected unemployment, right? I think I'm top talent, but at the same time, that type of person doesn't need a, a headhunter, right? Like the headhunter is hired because someone who is that super at their job at a current organization is really not looking for a new job. So they need someone to actively call into those organizations, literally smile and dial hope that they get someone on the phone, hopefully that their email doesn't get blocked and get that CEO at another similar organization down the block. I love smile and dial. Well, speaking <laughs> of that, what does the process, you know, look like in terms of how long it takes, how it works, and then what's the cost? And then I want to throw mm -hmm. in something else because now that we're working, you know, remotely in so many mm -hmm. ways, it, it's got to have like opened up, right? Versus, you know, like that, oh, well, you know, they're only in the tri-state area, so they're not going to be, you know, a candidate. This has got to really expand the opportunity for a lot of people. Sure. Yeah, you can say that. So first of all, we're talking about nonprofits here. So if you are an organization and you are thinking about retaining a firm to headhunt or to do an executive search for you, you really need to make sure that they are industry specific. I think that that's the biggest mistake nonprofits often make, um, and even when we're talking about hiring temps or even just you know regular searches of mid-level managers, which we which we do quite a lot, that's our bread and butter. Um, so many times, an executive director will reach out to me, hey, you know, I was referred by you from Women in Development or AFP or something like that. You know, what? How do you work? Blah blah blah. We have a call. Call goes great. They send me the job description. I do a follow up in two weeks and I say, hey, you know, I thought it went well. Didn't you want to work with me? Whatever, whatever happened. And I'll say one of our board members referred a search firm that they worked with at XYZ company. Mm -hmm. I've probably heard this more than 500 times. And I'm at the point where it's just like, oh, OK, <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to hear from you in three months. 
because you're still not going to have filled this job. And I always do. So having it be industry specific is super important. You know, there are very, very large executive search firms, but they work specifically with corporations. You know, we're talking about banking, um, food and beverage, hospitality, whatever, but on the high, high level. So if you want to work with a retained firm or for an executive search, you should make sure that they are handling, you know, higher education if you're a college or social services, whatever it is. So just going through that, I think that that's the most important thing. Um, Besides that, finding out from the hiring organization what they need specifically. Um, In most cases, and the reason that you should go this route, it's because the search is replacing someone and maybe it can't be announced yet. Or maybe the person doesn't know that they're being replaced, right? So Uh, maybe someone uh, is retiring, the world doesn't know yet, hasn't been released yet to current donors, or again, that person is being replaced. So it's going to be handled confidentially. I think that those are really important factors to hiring a headhunter, okay? Because another staffing firm typically will post and advertise, right? It's, It's a little bit more challenging to find the top talent if you can't post or advertise in that situation. Yeah. 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 Let me ask you this question. And this is kind of like drilling down a little bit. How do you feel about top, top, top level management crossing over, you know, in the, the sector? So in the nonprofit sector, we basically courtesy of the IRS, because they set the structure, there are nine main areas of impact or, you know, of mission. Do you feel like somebody who's been really successful and let's say um, an after school program or education can be really successful in an arts and cultural organization or an arts and cultural organization can be really good in human services? Um, do, Do you feel like we need to stay in those silos to get the best types of people when we're looking at, at this, this labor market? It's one of those answers where I would say it depends. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't oh. say yes or no. Um, I think sometimes we're coming out of such a specific sector and that's maybe where yeah. our legs lie, right? And all of our donors, everything that we know is in that sector. I think in that sort of situation, it's probably best to get to stay in the sector. Um, but at the same time, you know, maybe you're an organization and you just haven't been killing it with a CEO that's been always working in the same sector, right? Oh. So maybe it's it's time to bring a different set of eyes into your executive leadership team and hire someone from a different type of organization. And then let me add on to that because you just said something that kind of sparked another question. Um, how do you feel about that regionally? So let's say you're a mm-hmm. CEO of... Um, you know, an organization and you go to the same, you stay in the same sector, specific sector, but you move to the Midwest or you move to the West or you go all the way across to the South, whatever. Do you see that as something that's positive or negative or a challenge or? Yeah, it's funny that you say that. So a lot of the organizations I work with here in New York have a thing about getting people from New York or very similar urban areas. So maybe we're talking about Chicago or Philadelphia or Camden or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I understand why they want that. They wanna have someone that knows the politics and the government behind the types of challenges that they may face. Um, On the flip side of that, I do think that there is an advantage to hiring a headhunter if you want someone from a different region, Mm -hmm. because those larger headhunting firms are going to number one, be able to do that outreach and have that network pretty much already built so they can tap in pretty easily. So if you're open to someone relocating and you're, you're paying top dollar for that, I would say go with headhunter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, it's a, it's a really an amazing thing. And, And then before I move on to my next question is, um, do how do you do that fee structure? I mean, I've always yeah. heard that they're going to pay a percentage of what the, the annual contract is, or is it all mm-hmm. over the board? Yeah. So, so typical industry standard would be 25 to 30% of the first year salary of the candidate hired. 
-hmm. So when we're talking about a retained search or a headhunter, what they typically do would they would take an average of what that salary is and ask the initial payment be a third upfront, okay. a third about three months in, and the remainder of the breakdown of that number once the salary is decided would be then paid out at the completion of the search or the first day of that hire. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you for helping us understand mm -hmm. that because that that's a, that's a pivotal piece. I've got another nuanced question, and that is, can individuals contact or promote themselves directly to headhunters, or is this kind of like more of a surreptitious kind of thing? How do we I do that? I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's best to promote or reach out to them because, mm -hmm. you know, again, you shouldn't if you're actively looking for a new job, you're mm -hmm. probably not that happy in your current job, right? And again, we're seeking top talent that is really not looking for a new job. At the same time, you know, I think that there are a couple of retained search firms that do specific to um, nonprofits that I've met at, you know, fundraising day or whatever. And you, you can be on their mailing list, right? So you kind yeah. of can stay abreast of what the searches they may be working on. And then that way, if you see something that does interest you, you can reach out to them. But mm -hmm. in terms of like checking in monthly or weekly, like it, it doesn't really make sense. It's not a good look. Okay. Okay. That's good. And I, I knew that was a good question to ask you because I knew you'd be like, you know, really honest and drilled down into using that word tone, like what is the tone? And and I love yeah. that you said it's not a good look. So say no more. Yeah. You know, with all these things that we've been talking about, is this a viable process? Is it is it something that we really need to be thinking about and in investing? Or is this old school thinking and it's not really a part of the ecosystem of, of the nonprofit sector when it comes to labor? Again, it depends, right? So from my perspective, I'm always worried about the nonprofit's budget. But at the same time, you might find yourself in a situation where, again, someone is retiring or you're replacing someone without that person knowing mm. it's probably the best option. Um, a lot of times nonprofits are just spread thin in general. So mm. then to have to take on a confidential executive search and put that on the plate of, you know, HR, the executive director or whatever it might be. It it just doesn't make sense. So you really have to weigh out sort of the situation that your organization is in. If it's a director of development, I, I don't think that you need to do something like this. I think we're talking CEO, CFO, executive director, CIO, that C-level suite. I think it's important. Okay. Well, and I think that I, I like what you said about where you are in the process. Is that person gone or is that person mm -hmm. going? Because this is going to fall back on the board or a search committee um, and they're, they're volunteers and they're not experts. And so I can just see where there's like a whole layer of things that really can move you towards just hiring the first, you know, person that fogs the mirror, right? Versus that or, that or, you know, I just feel like whenever there is a board in charge with a search or some level in charge of a search within a nonprofit, they really drop the ball with scheduling yeah. and all the things that go into that. And when we're talking about a high level candidate, you really can't jerk them around. You know, you have to have a set interview schedule with your board or whoever needs to meet them and then make sure that you stay on that timeline and fit them in. It can't be, oh, I'm waiting for X, Y, Z person to get back to me because they didn't check their email, you know, or, you know, your the board is always on vacation. Right. So how do you nail down your board members to stick to an interview timeline? So I think that in situations like this, you know, it just it just makes sense. You don't want to jerk these CEOs around. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's really wise. And I think um, especially for organizations that have maybe had like a beloved tenured, you know, multi-year leader and everybody's kind of like bummed that they're leaving, you know, versus um excited about change do you know what i mean that mindset man sure. it makes all the difference in the world with how um active or aggressive a board is going to move forward yeah you're right i didn't even think of that you know it's a tough thing and i see it in my community 
Um, and I think all communities, as we're aging, our leadership is aging, we have this explosion of retirements, and now, you know, we, we haven't done a good job building the bench, like who's up next, right? And so yeah. this makes it really a challenge. And uh, would you, as we end our time with you, would you say that it is a, a candidate's market or it's more of a hiring, you know, it's it's more of an organizational market? What are your sense of, of that? I don't even know. I don't know what's going. It's so, <laughs> it's just, you know, I know that I've been saying this for probably the past three or four times. Like, I don't know what's going on. It's one of those things that it seems like there's a real shortage and it is a candidate's market. Mm -hmm. And then it's like silent for a few weeks. And then I feel the opposite. Yeah. I, it's almost like every quarter is bringing a new situation. Mm -hmm. which is weird. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I love that you articulated that because I have had a sense from just the calls that I get from people that are like, Hey, we're looking for this. If you know anybody, you know, let me know, send them our way. And then I, I talk to people that are, you know, maybe changing their jobs or wanting to change their job or their sector or what are still staying in the nonprofit purview. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh my God, it's so hard to find a job. You know, so it's like you're, it's like mixed yeah. messages. It's very, yeah. Awesome. And then the people that say it's so hard to, you know, hard, so hard to find a job. I mean, you just have to say, okay, well, are you getting interviews or, you know, if you're getting interviews, your resume is good. And then your interviews skills are bad, right? Mm -hmm. Are you not getting callbacks? Okay. Your resume is bad. So you really need to dissect that. You know, I see people mm -hmm. posting that often, you know, saying I'm, I've been looking for six months, five months. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, it's not, we're not in a recession. Unemployment is low. You know, there's, there's something going on there. Mm -hmm. I love, you need I to love, change your approach. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a brilliant way to end because that kind of is the bridge between those two issues, you know, mm -hmm. not enough, a sense that there's, there's no opportunity. And then there's a, a sense that there's no candidate pool. That's right. brilliant, Katie. You are brilliant. So what a great way to end. Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. Check out staffingboutique.org. Um, you can learn more about Katie and her journey and her team and how they, you know, really look at this unique marketplace with the nonprofit sector. I think it's riveting. And, you know, Katie, at the, at the end of the day, if we don't have staff and leadership that can do this work, we have nothing. Because we, you know, we, we can't even fundraise if we don't have the development staff, right? I mean, yeah. we have to have our people in the team set. And so uh, what you do is just so vital and that you come on and share uh, your information with us is is tremendous. So yeah, I was I was just at one of my uh, favorite clients events the other night and like the staff there just loves the organization so much that it's like, it's one of my favorite events because the team and the culture of the organization is so for championing, championing that organization and their mission. Like it's, it's a blast. Yeah. And I don't see that with all of my candidates. I don't see that with all of my clients. Right. Right. Well, when you see it, it's really special and yeah. uh, it's, it's really something to, uh, you know, it's, it's so it, in so many ways, it's the hardest success, right? You know, it's yeah. that beating heart of the organization. And so, um, Katie, we always love having you on. It's so cool. I learned so much from you and you always give me something to think about. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, a big thank you to our partner uh, sponsors as well. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, nonprofit tech talk, and JMT Consulting. So Katie, I am going to be speaking at a conference in Boston next week, traveling across the country, my friend. Which conference? Um, Really an interesting conference. It's a, a fintech financial technology conference that JMT Consulting puts on. Um, okay. specifically for the nonprofit sector. And nice. so, have fun and safe travels. I'm flying to Atlanta to go to a staffing conference. <laughs> we'll be like, <laughs> yeah, in the skies. It's going to be 85 degrees in Atlanta. Oh, holy moly. Holy moly. Oh my gosh. Well, hey, everybody, as you have joined us today and learned so much along with our friend Katie Warnick, we want to leave you with this message. 
and that is to stay well so you can do well. Thank you so much, my friend. Safe travels, and we'll see.